Okay, so biomes, guys, this is kind of a review of energy and climate. Okay, biomes are an ecological region on Earth. Okay, um, ecological regions, their locations are determined by mostly the factors that affect climate. Latitude, altitude, okay, wind, bar or wind patterns, mountain barriers, all of that kind of stuff determines the location of these ecological regions that we call biomes. All right, so what we're going to do is go over the different biomes and explain kind of their characteristics, their locations, things like that. And the expectation for you is this. I will ask you to do two things on both the unit and final exam with this lesson. Those two things are, one, there'll be multiple choice questions that will give a description along with a picture of a biome and you will have to identify it. So is it A, tropical rainforest, B, tundra, C, desert, or whatever, okay? So that kind of thing, you'd be able to identify it from a picture and description. The second thing will be in the written response. I put a biome in and I say, or sorry, not a biome, I put in a climatogram and I ask you, look at this climatogram and tell me what biome it comes from and explain why. All right, so I'm combining that you can take a climatogram, read and interpret it, and combine that with biomes and be able to tell me this climatogram comes from uh, the prairie because, and then you give me an explanation, or this, this climatogram comes from the tropical rainforest because. Okay, those are the two things that you'll have to do with the information I go over today. All right, so. These are the biomes of the world, okay? Color-coded on the map of the world here, all right? So we'll start out with tropical rainforest. Tropical rainforest is the light green color. And you can see that almost all of the tropical rainforest is near the equator. Okay, is near the equator, okay? Because obviously to have a tropical rainforest, it needs to be both hot and Wet, yeah, okay, yeah, tropical rainforest, I mean, rain is in the name. That would imply it gets a lot of it, all right? So tropical rainforests are generally an equatorial climate. If you are near the equator, does the amount of light you receive change very much? No, not like it does up here, right? Like we're now getting into the brightest and most intense sunshine of the year, whereas at the equator, that changes very little, but neither does their length of day. Okay, so uh, things to think about there, right? So we can see that there's lots of tropical rainforest, obviously in South America. This is mostly the Amazon rainforest right here. So that would be like Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, okay, places like that. Um, there's some in certain parts of Africa, okay? Uh, lots of Southeast Asia. So that would be like in uh, parts of India, uh, south, uh, Southern China, Laos, Vietnam, okay? All of like Papua New Guinea, okay? And all of the kind of um, South Pacific type places there. Uh, and then uh, a little bit here in Central America. So this would be like uh, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, Cuba, and places like that. Um, that's generally where we find all of our tropical rainforest near the equator, okay? Uh, the brown stuff here, that's savanna, okay? Savanna is typically what we would associate with Africa, okay? Typically in Africa, you have kind of the wide plains. It's a, basically a tropical grassland, right? Not, not so much jungle, but tropical grassland. So you have lions, tigers, but no bears, okay? Um, and you have like wildebeests and, and stuff like that, giraffes. That's, that's the savanna. So most of the savanna is obviously then in Africa, right? But there is some in South America as well. Most of this is actually human caused. Right, due to like deforestation, slash and burn agriculture, that kind of stuff. Okay, but there's some naturally occurring, but most of it is the result of human interaction. There's a little bit on the coasts, okay, or just inside of the coasts of Australia, okay, um, but that's most of where it is. Most of it is in Africa, which is why, of course, we associate that with like zebras and, and things like that. All right, desert. Now, there's different kinds of desert, okay, but. Um, Mostly we see we associate desert with like northern Africa, right? So that would be like Tunisia, Egypt, okay, places like that. Hot and brutally dry, okay. So this would be the Sahara here, okay. Most of the Middle East going to be all desert, okay. The uh, the outback, okay, the inner portion of the continent of Australia is also desert, okay. We see some desert here in North America. This would be like Southern California, Nevada, Utah, okay, Northern Mexico, the Baja, all of those kind of places that would all be desert in there as well, okay. And we see some desert here, okay, in uh, in Asia. And this right here that's behind, what what is this here with the white and the blue? 
Anyone know what's right there? I'll give you a hint. These two continents are smashing into each other right here. Mountains, which mountains? Really, really tall ones. These are the Himalayas, okay? And behind them is a desert. Is this a rain shadow? Yes, okay? This is the definition of rain shadow. I mean, if I was shining a light right here, the mountains would cast a shadow. That's where the desert is. It's, this is the Gobi Desert, okay? It is the rain shadow desert caused by the Himalayan mountains, okay? We see a similar effect here in North America, okay? You can see that the prairies are a rain shadow of the Rockies, okay? They're just behind the Rockies, okay? And keeping the rain from getting across. All right, uh, extreme desert is this kind of whitish blue color here that we see on the top of the Himalayas, most of Greenland, okay? Uh, anywhere where there's really high mountain ranges, we see extreme desert, and there's one continent that's missing here. Don't say Atlantis. Somebody said Atlantis the last time I taught this. That's, okay, Antarctica is missing. Some people say that's actually Atlantis, but whatever. Okay, um, Antarctica would be entirely this color, Right? It's covered with glaciers, rocks, and ice, nothing else. Okay? Um, so that would be all uh, extreme desert there. Okay? Extreme desert, just cold, desert. cold desert, yes, extremely cold desert. Again, nothing but rocks and ice. Okay? Um, and Antarctica is actually the driest continent, not Africa. Okay? Um, the least amount of rainfall actually happens in Antarctica. Right? It's covered with you know, several kilometers thick worth of ice, but that's the result of thousands of years worth of accumulation, okay? not because it gets lots every year. Right? It's slowly accumulated and not been allowed to melt for thousands of years. Okay. All right, uh, chaparral is this kind of uh, darker brown color. Okay? We often call that the Mediterranean climate. I can't imagine why. in so much as it's all around the Mediterranean, okay? There's a little tiny bit of it here on the southwest, uh, southeastern coast of, sorry, southwestern coast of Australia, okay? The tip of Africa here, so that'd be South Africa, okay? And a little bit here in kind of like Southern California, that area, right? Um, but mostly what you see there is it's hot, it's fairly dry, um, and you get things like olive, uh, you know, uh, it's great for growing wine, for having vineyards and, and stuff like that. Very hot, but very dry. All right, uh, temperate grassland. We typically call that prairie where we are, okay? There's lots of it here in North America, lots of it in Asia, okay? Like through Mongolia and places like that, okay? It's very much prairie, okay? Uh, there's some in Australia as well before you get to the desert part in the interior, and there's even some in South America. But notice that this part of South America is below the Tropic of Capricorn, so it's below that 23 and a half degrees, okay? Um, so it's, it's more of a, pol like a not polar, but a temperate climate down in there. Okay, uh, temperate deciduous forest is the light green color, okay? That's what you would typically associate with like central Canada. So if you've been to Ontario or Quebec, that's temperate deciduous forest. The trees all lose their leaves. That's what deciduous means. It's temperate because typically the winters are not extremely cold. There's also not extended periods of drought. Rainfall tends to be fairly even. That's why you get the type of trees you get growing there as opposed to here where we get much less in the way of trees. Okay, taiga is um, like the boreal forest is another name for it. Okay, so if you've been to Fort McMurray, you've been in the boreal forest. You go into Banff, that's boreal forest as well. All right, anywhere where you see just that carpet of spruce trees everywhere, okay, that's boreal forest or, or taiga, and we see that much of Canada is covered with that, okay, especially in the northern parts and along the mountains, okay. You also see it even in equatorial places that are high altitude. Much of Russia, okay, is, is that, parts of Siberia, okay, are, are taiga, um, but again, it's either a high latitude or a high altitude biome. You don't see it near the equator unless it's a very high altitude. All right, and then we have tundra. Tundra is an Arctic grassland, right? Most of the time it's just covered in snow, okay? So again, you don't really see that anywhere near the equator, okay? Just in the northern parts of the world. So northern parts of Canada, okay? Extreme northern parts of Russia, okay, are all of that. This is where, you know, if back in the old Soviet Union days, that's where they would send you if you screwed up, okay? They send you salt mine in Siberia work you yes exactly we're in rocky four okay. yeah where he fought, fought ivan drago you haven't seen rocky four stallone is absolutely jacked in that one okay and and dolph lundgren is also absolutely jacked in that one they are freakishly large both of them yeah they're a little washed up at this point 
Uh, I mean, not that I wouldn't want to look as good as Sly does right now at like 70 years old, but I mean, those muscles on a 70 year old just look fake. I don't know. H, a lot of HGH, I would imagine. Okay. All right. So that's the location of everything. Now we're going to go into the details okay, of, uh, of all of those types of biomes. So we'll start off with the tropical rainforest. Anyone ever been to a real rainforest? Okay. So it's, it is not anything. Yeah, right. The Calgary Zoo, right? Okay. It is nothing like forests in Canada. Okay. The tropical rainforest is just unbelievably thick. All right. Hmm? Is it dangerous? Well, anything could be dangerous. And you know that the tropical rainforest is any more dangerous than any other part of the world. Okay. But it is unbelievably thick. And there's many layers. Right? A forest in Canada, we can walk through the forest in Canada, right? There's not a lot of undergrowth and you can see quite a ways between the trees and whatever. Tropical rainforest is not that way at all. Okay? There's undergrowth layers, there's understory layers, there's canopy layers, there's subcanopy, there's just all kinds of layers of growth. Okay? And it just grows everywhere really, really thick. Right? That's because there's lots of moisture rains all the time and it's warm all the time. There's no seasons where uh, the, the plants have to go dormant and slow down their growth or anything. It can just, they can just go uh, all of the time. So this is what the tropical rainforest would look like from above. All you're seeing here is one layer. You're seeing the canopy. That's the upper layer of the rainforest. Below that, there could be up to eight different layers of vegetation, right? So it's, it's very storied on the way up from the ground. Okay. In fact, if you're on the ground in some of the thickest parts, you wouldn't really know whether it was a sunny or a cloudy day. Okay. The canopy is literally that thick. All right. So the general characteristics of the tropical rainforest are as follows. Okay. Um, about 13% of the Earth's land surface, roughly. Okay. Uh, they're complex. They're variable. There's lots of different kinds of plants in there. Okay. There's no distinct seasonality. No summer, winter, fall, or spring. It's basically the same all year. Okay. Okay. Um, High temperatures and high rainfall, right? Not just even all year, but high all year long. Okay? That means that typically they are flooded, right? Flooding is common to the tropical rainforest. Okay? Because precipitation exceeds evaporation, that means more rain falls than can actually evaporate. Okay? There's lots of luxuriant vegetation. So if you look at these pictures here, they're actually like probably older than you or close to it. Okay? Um, you can see that these mountains, even though they're very sheer and steep, are covered in growth. Okay? You look at a mountainside that that's sheer and steep in Canada, and it's bare because it's much drier and much colder. Right? We can't get growth on the sides of mountains like that. Here, I mean, the mountains look like a chia pet. Okay? The stuff just grows all over them in every single nook and cranny. Okay? Even on this like, big rock spire here, there's growth all over that thing. Okay? It's just that wet. Okay? that there can be growth basically anywhere. Right? And you can see also that there's many different colors within all of these forests, right? Where if you go to a big forest in Canada, like you go to Banff and it's pretty much all the same color, right? So it's basically four or five kinds of trees. Whereas in here, there could be hundreds of different kinds of plants and trees. It's much more diverse. Right? So climatogram for a tropical rainforest. Our temperature line, is pretty much level. There's no bell curve because again, the amount of sunlight received in this area is the same all year, right? It's equatorial. There's no winter and summer. And the rainfall is also relatively even. Okay. I know there's a bit of a dip here in the middle, but I mean, this is still relatively even, especially when we're talking about the wettest month is like 215 millimeters of rain. Okay. That's, that's over 20 centimeters in their wettest month. Their driest month is 150 millimeters. That's 15 centimeters of rain. To give you some idea, in 2013, when we had the big flood, that month, we had 17 centimeters of rain. That's their driest month. Okay, Quite a bit different place than here. Okay. All right. Um, so that's the first part. That's our general characteristic. So Again, remember, on the test, you're going to get a climatogram and you're going to have to match it up with a biome and explain. So there's an idea of what it would look like. Okay, The soils in the tropical rainforest are highly weathered. They're actually very poor. Right? It's not a, a good place to do any farming right? for the reason that A, it's flooded a lot, and B, that flooding 
causes a process called leaching. Right? And it's just like it sounds. It sucks stuff out of the soil, just like a leech sucks blood. Okay? So if you've got water sitting on top of the dirt because it's flooded, all the nutrients that are in the soil dissolve because the soil becomes saturated okay, with the water. So all the nutrients dissolve into the water and then by diffusion move out of the soil into the floodwaters and run off. So the, the soils are actually very nutrient poor. The only reason that plants like this can grow is because there's a constant supply of new new nutrients from the sediment and stuff that comes along. Okay, but it's very hard to farm there because your soil is constantly being eroded and then redeposited and eroded and redeposited. So it's not great for growing things because you would constantly have to reseed. Okay, decomposition is incredibly rapid. If something dies in the tropical rainforest, it is decomposed and gone in a matter of weeks. Okay. Whereas in Canada, if a tree falls in the forest, it makes a sound and then it sits there for like 30 years okay, before it completely decomposes because it's only being actively worked on by decomposers for maybe four months of the year. Right? The rest of the year it's frozen and nothing's happening. In the tropical rainforest, hot, wet, there's way more bugs. Okay? Bugs and insects and bacteria really help to get decomposition going so things can decompose a lot more quickly, a lot more fungus as well. You would decompose pretty quickly. Yeah. I'm a little scared of where your thought process is. Okay. Note to self, don't turn your back on heaven. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, intense weathering caused by high rainfall means, and so that's the leaching process. Okay. But also you have that a lot of soil just gets washed away. If you've got floodwaters moving quickly across the surface, they're going to strip it clean. Okay. We saw how that happened okay, around here. I mean, the river was just like chocolate milk when it, when it flooded. That's because it had picked up dirt and sediment from all kinds of places and just washed it away. Okay. It took it all away and stripped everything really. And once the floodwaters went down, a lot of things were quite clean actually afterwards. Okay. Um, and then they're often low in calcium, potassium, and any other dissolved minerals because they've obviously been leached out of the soil. Okay, so the soil profile looks like this. Okay, we talked about how there's an A horizon, that's the top soil, a B horizon, and then, then the parent material, the C horizon below that. Okay, the tropical rainforest has very little topsoil because it's always getting washed away. Right, so the topsoil is very, very small. There's lots of clay because clay tends to not wash away as easily and cements itself together. So um, there's lots of that, but the trees and plants get most of their nutrients from the flood water as opposed to from the soil. Right? But they also have to have special roots in order to keep from suffocating. Right? If we have plants around here and they're underwater for any length of time, they die. Right? Because they, their roots can't breathe and they literally suffocate. Okay? Plants in the tropical rainforest could have their roots underwater for several months. So they have to have special roots that are capable of, of absorbing oxygen and getting it to the submerged parts of the tree. It would die too. Yeah, remember we we got to be able to exchange carbon dioxide and oxygen through the leaves, and if they're covered in water, that doesn't happen. Yeah. All right, so vegetation in the tropical rainforest it's very diverse, right? Um, there can be up to eight different layers of vegetation, okay, from the ground to the top of the canopy, and there can be up to a hundred different tree types in one hectare. Okay, one hectare is a hundred meters by a hundred meters. It's roughly the area enclosed by our running track. So about the football field, that's about one hectare. Okay. In a Canadian forest, one hectare would have a hundred trees. Okay. And they're probably all of like three types. In the tropical rainforest, there could be thousands of trees in that same area of a hundred different species. Okay. So it's extremely diverse. Okay. No two trees alike, almost like almost like snowflakes. And okay. when you walk through the tropical rainforest, lots of different kinds of trees. Okay. Um, so this is what a tropical rainforest looks like at ground level. Can you see very far? This is why you carry a machete when you go into the tropical rainforest. Okay. It's not to, to defend yourself against large large animals. There actually aren't a lot of large animals in the tropical rainforest, mostly bugs. Okay? Large animals have a hard time in the tropical rainforest because they can't go anywhere. Okay? It's hard to maneuver and navigate. So you need a machete in order to clear out all the undergrowth. And 
you can follow your path of destruction back to where you started. Right? That's the lesson I learned. My dad and I went on a hike through one of, through this, and we didn't have a machete, and we got lost. And it's really hard to figure out where you are when you can't see the sun okay, through the canopy. Right? You can't hear anything. It blocks the sounds of roads and things like that because it's so thick. Right? We were just really lucky that we just walked in a straight line and actually came upon a road that we could follow. Otherwise, we'd have been hopelessly lost because we didn't have anything to kind of track us back, okay? It's very wet, the growth is so thick, you can't really leave footprints even, okay? It's just really hard to track your way back, right? Some trees have these special snorkel roots. I think I talked about these back in the biology unit, okay? So again, those are important there for allowing those trees to survive flooding conditions. All right, the animals in the tropical rainforest. The biggest animal you would likely see would be the three-toed sloth. That's the one here on the far left, right? Most of the animals are arboreal. That means they live in the trees because it's too hard to navigate on the ground. Plus, it's often flooded, right? If you are an animal that burrows and lives underground, you don't live in the tropical rainforest, right? Unless you have like scuba gear because right? your, your burrow would always be full of water. So you just there aren't a lot of burrowing underground animals in the tropical rainforest. Hmm? Well, gorillas don't really live so much in the tropical, like the rainy, rainy parts. And they can live in the trees, like orangutans and stuff like that, right? Like they live in the trees. The big gorillas typically live in mountainous areas where there's less surface water. All right, so the three-toed sloth is a great example of an arboreal animal, okay? They have big long claws and they're not for defending itself it's actually they're they're like coat hangers they can just throw them over a tree and literally hang out there okay they just just like a coat hanger they just pull them over and they just sit there and they sleep a lot because they're really lazy okay um and they they just you know they get hungry they just reach over grab a leaf and munch on it and then they go back to sleep okay they don't have to worry too much about predators because there aren't any large predators that can take them down that would be able to climb the trees Right? So they don't have to be really fast. If you put like a three-toed sloth on the ground, they're almost unable to move. Right? They are, their musculature is designed to move when they're hanging upside down and moving hand over hand in the trees. If you put them on the ground where they actually have to support their own weight with their, with their muscles, they can't do it. Their muscles are designed to, to hang as opposed to support directly above the ground. Right? If you look at their, their structure, look how big their back is. Right? Lots of muscles in the back, very little muscles in the front. Okay? And so they just don't walk well or crawl well on the ground. That's why they're one of the slowest animals on earth. In fact, they are the slowest mammal. Okay? They are really, really slow. All right, um, small rodents, okay? Also fairly prevalent as long as they can live in the trees. Okay, like this little red panda here. Okay, very cute. Um, and then there's like dung beetles, lots of bugs. Okay. If you don't like bugs, don't go to the tropical rainforest because you won't enjoy yourself. There's bugs everywhere. And some of them are big and ugly. And some of them bite. Lots of them bite. You won't like it if you don't like bugs. Okay. Um, you, you also have like walking sticks. Anyone ever seen a walking stick? Okay. They're really a cool bug. Okay. Um, if, you, if you get one on your hand, they you know, and you and they're just hanging there. They move just like a branch in a tree would move. They're almost perfectly camouflaged in their environment. Okay, um, I had a TA in university. He was an entomologist, and he had all kinds of pet bugs. And he had a pet walking stick. And when you would put it on his hand, okay, if he would blow on it, it would sway just like a branch in the tree. It's part of its instincts to to mimic the natural movement of the area it was from. All right? Um, you'll see lots of reptiles. Okay, because reptiles are really good in hot, wet conditions, okay? Um, yes, generally, the general rule is the brighter colored the frogs are, the more poisonous they are, okay? You don't get brightly colored if you're worried about getting eaten, okay? Because bright colors, everybody notices you, and they look at you and go, you're really brightly colored, you're probably not good for me, okay? That's the general thing. Um, it's something called taste aversion. If an animal eats something and it gets sick, it will generally avoid that appearance, smell, and taste for a very long time. Okay, you've probably noticed if you ever ate something and then got sick shortly thereafter, the next time you saw it, you're like, I, I feel sick just looking at that. Okay, that's that's just a natural evolutionary reaction to being sick. Okay, you will avoid the thing that you think made you sick. All right, um, and then you've got lots of predator bugs as well. 
right? Like the praying mantis, okay, is a is a predaceous bug. Okay, kills other bugs and even sometimes small mammals, okay, uh, depending on the size of the mantis. So, um, yeah, there's lots and lots of insects, though. Okay, the food chains in the tropical rainforest. Okay, Luke, I'm getting really tired of you talking when I'm talking. I need you to shut up. Okay, the food chains in the tropical rainforest are very, very long because it starts out with this bug and the bug that eats that bug and the bug that eats the bug that eats the bug and so on and so on. There's like 12 bugs and then there might be like a bird, okay, or uh, a lizard or something like that at the top of the food chain, okay. But there's so many bugs that the food chains are really, really long. All right, uh, lots of species are also, in addition to being arboreal, where they live in the trees, some are endemic. That goes for the plants as well. That means they live in only one very, very small area. And that's the only place on earth that they live. So if there's uh, logging or deforestation of some kind in that area, you could drive that species to extinction because that's the only place on earth they are. Okay? That's a pretty, pretty major concern uh, in, in the tropical rainforest areas. So there's a lot of study that's trying to catalog the the uh, life that lives in each part so that they know, all right, this part we can log because there's, you know, that stuff is fairly diverse. This stuff is endemic. We can't log or have agriculture here. Okay. All right. Chemical cycling, okay? Nutrient cycling, decomposition. We already said that's really fast. It's hot. It's wet. There's lots of bacteria. There's lots of bugs. There's lots of fungus. All the things that can cause things to decompose quickly are present in the tropical rainforest. So things do tend to decompose very, very fast. All right, the savanna. All right, so we talked about how this is mostly what you would consider like the safari kind of part of Africa to be, okay? Uh, so it is a tropical grassland. It gets way more rain than we would, but it gets it all at once, right? It doesn't get it evenly over the year. In fact, there are places in the savanna that get more rain than the rainforest does. The issue is, is that there's the monsoon season where you get all your rain, and then there's like nine months of no rain at all. Right? So a, a big forest can't survive a long period of drought like that. So you typically get more of a grassland instead. This would be during kind of the, uh, just after the monsoon season, everything's really green. Okay, And this picture would be several months into the nine month long drought. All right, everything has gone dormant because it's been dry for a very, very long time. Wildfires are a big problem because it can get very dry and very hot. And there's lots of all this dead grass everywhere that can catch on fire. Okay. Um, so it's generally referred to as a grassland biome, but there are places where there can be kind of open woodland as well, not like thick forest, but you know, wooded areas here and there, depending on whether there's like springs underground and things like that. Okay. All right, so the climate, again, you look at that climatogram and you see that the temperature line is pretty level. All right, it's, this is an equatorial biome. So you're not having distinct seasons here. The temperature stays pretty, pretty level the whole year. But you can see that there's definitely a rainy season and then there's a dry season. Okay, so there's the monsoons and then there's basically nothing in terms of precipitation for months. All right, again, that's what prevents a really thick, luxuriant forest from forming. Okay, but you can see here the amount of rain that falls during the monsoon season is considerable. Right, the wettest month in the rainforest was just over 200 millimeters. Okay, these this one's got several months or two months anyway that are 350 or more. Right, so they get a lot of rain, but they get it in a very short space of time. All right, because of the long dry season, lots of plants estivate. That means they become dormant, just like our plants do in the wintertime, except they're doing it to avoid heat and drought. So the exact opposite, okay? Um, so precip precipitation is variable, okay? Um, and lots of wildfires can happen, okay? And that can produce lots of kind of strange uh, patterns to the vegetation inside, right? Um, this big mound that the cheetah is sitting on, what is that? It's a termite mound, okay? Bugs are still highly present in the savanna, especially termites, right? Because termites love kind of dry organic plant material. And because of all the dry grass, okay? And in some places like dormant trees, there's lots of places for them to get food, right? The plants in the savanna have to produce incredible numbers of seeds because the termites will actually eat most of them. 
Okay? The termites get everywhere. They eat anything that's plant material that they can get their little mouth parts on. Okay? They're not teeth because they're a bug. Okay? They're mouth parts on. They'll eat it all. Okay? They're a big deal in more tropical areas in terms of construction. Okay? Around here, we don't worry about termites like eating the frame of our house because termites don't live up here. But if you live in a tropical area and you get termites in your house, they can literally make your house fall down. Right? They will eat the frame. That's the wood your house is made of to the point where your house will collapse. Okay? They'll turn your house to sawdust. Okay? If you put a, a, like a two by four near that termite mound, it would be a pile of sawdust in a matter of days. Okay? They're just that voracious. Does that still happen to these trees? No, that's pine beetle. That's different. We had that in Alberta as well. A couple of good cold winters usually kills them off, but if you get too many mild winters in a row, you get a big infestation of pine beetle. Yeah, and that's when you'll see whole hillsides that are dead, not burned, right? They're that kind of orangish red color, yeah. Okay, um, so that's climate for the savanna. Okay, so make a note of that shape of that climatogram. Okay, um, so for the vegetation, okay, lots of the trees, when there are trees in the savanna, are fire resistant. Fires are that common. Right? The eucalyptus tree, for example. Okay? The eucalyptus tree can have all of its leaves and everything all burned right off of it, and it'll go right back. Okay? It has this very thick but porous bark. Okay? And because it's thick and porous, it acts like an insulator, and it insulates against the heat of the fire okay? and keeps the tree from actually, innards of the tree, from being damaged. Right? So a eucalyptus tree can actually survive a fire. Now, um, you'll typically see in the savanna, okay, um, you know, tall grasses and then shorter trees. In fact, sometimes the grasses can be taller than the trees, okay? I had a student who sent me this picture from his cabin in South Africa, okay? He actually moved back to South Africa, but he was, when I was talking about this stuff called elephant grass, he's like, oh, Coder, that stuff grows around my house back home. I'm like, where are you, where are you from? Because I didn't realize, I didn't notice his accent. It wasn't very thick. He said, I'm from South Africa. I'm just outside of like Johannesburg. We have this back in the safari. We have a cabin that we go to in the summer. And when we go there, we spend like the first three days cutting down the elephant grass because you can't see the house. It grows taller than the house. Okay. It's actually like closer to bamboo than it is to grass. Okay. It can get really, really tall and has kind of thick um, stalks, right? But it can be really, really long. They call it elephant grass because elephants can walk through it and you can't see them. Okay. It's that tall. It's just ridiculous. Okay. So I had him send me this picture. Okay. Um, he told me his house was somewhere in that picture, but he can't see it. Okay. That's how tall the grass is. It's ridiculous. All right. Um, so uh, those, that's a pretty good source of food, obviously. Okay. I mean, you got lots of really big herbivores. Okay? You got like zebras, elephants, giraffes, all these animals in the savanna. Okay. And the reason you get such big herds of these things is because there's so much to eat. Okay. There's lots and lots of grass. And that's also, again, why there's so many termites. Okay. Um, so they have to be able, all the vegetation has to be able to survive drought, though, because there's going to be long periods of drought. Okay. The soils tend to be very thick, okay? the opposite of the tropical rainforest. Yes, we get the monsoon season, but every year you get grasses growing and then the grasses die. And all of that grass builds up this really thick layer of thatch and organic material, okay? making a really thick, nutrient-dense soil right, that they can grow in. So you can see here, like this is three feet, so that's almost a meter, and we're still looking at just a horizon. Right? So this is still just topsoil. Right? We haven't even got to the B horizon yet. So really, really thick, rich soils. All right. For the animals, the food chains in the savanna are the opposite of the rainforest. The rainforest's food chains were really long. The savannas are really short. Okay? Because they have such big herbivores, like wildebeests and antelope and zebras and stuff, the predators that take them down also have to be pretty big. So basically your top carnivore preys on the herbivore. There's not a lot of like secondary consumers. You guys recall that from junior high, right? You got your producers and then your primary consumers, secondary consumers and tertiary consumers. Okay. In the tropical rain or sorry, in the uh, savanna, you've got your herbivores and then you have your tertiary consumer. They're, they're right. They're right there. There's no secondary. Okay. The food chains are extremely short just because these are so big. Okay, uh, so you got lions, you got tigers, you got cheetahs, uh, you got hyenas, okay, all those kinds of predators that take down the large 
herbivore animals. Now, there may be some food chains that are a little longer that involve insects and birds, okay? But the ones that involve the main large animals are quite short. Okay. Um, yeah. Now, one thing about the, uh, the plants that live there as well, especially the trees. You can see here, all the trees have these flattened tops and this umbrella shape. Right, they're flat here on the bottom. They're also flat on the top. Okay, the reason for that? Well, there's a few reasons. First off, how many of the animals in that picture can eat leaves off that tree? Zero. There's no giraffes in this picture. Okay, that's why giraffes have such long necks. It allows them to eat the branches okay, and the leaves off of this kind of tree. But secondly, look at what's underneath where all the animals are. Shade. Yeah. If you have a big umbrella shape, you can shade your roots. And that means that there's less evaporation from the soil where your roots are, and it helps to conserve the moisture okay, in the soil around your roots. So having that shape is very beneficial, which is why so many of the savanna trees are umbrella shaped. Okay? So this would be the savanna in the height of the dry season. This would be the savanna in the height of the monsoon season. All right, so it can go from flooding to extreme drought in the space of a few months. All right, lots and lots of rain, and then none at all. Okay, questions there? All right, for the desert, there's different kinds of desert. What they all have in common is that they are all what? Sandy. Not necessarily. Some are rocky, some are sandy, but they're all dry. Okay, that's what they have in common. They're all dry. Some are hot, some are cold. Some are rocky, some are sandy. Right, but they all have in common that they are dry, very, very dry. Right. So um, not all deserts are the big, barren, expansive, shifting sand like you would, you know, like you would picture North Africa and like Tatooine if you watch Star Wars. Okay, that was filmed in Northern Africa and Tunisia. Okay, not a lot of deserts actually look like that. Most deserts are actually a little more rocky than they are sandy. Okay, um, so semi-arid land covers almost a third of the Earth's land surface. Okay, with about 60% of that one third being true desert, All right? So you can see here, this is a rocky desert. This is the Sonoran Desert in like Arizona, that kind of area, All right? Very, very dry, but seasonal, right? It's not hot in this desert all year. In the summertime, it's wickedly hot, okay? It can reach to be over 50 degrees Celsius during the day, right? But at night, it can cool off considerably. And in the wintertime, they can even sometimes get snow in Arizona. Okay? In parts of it, anyway. There's a big ski hill in Flagstaff, Arizona, which is the capital. Okay, um, so yeah, there's there's uh, lots of differences to the desert. It just depends on where it is. But again, they all have in common that they are very dry. Yes, a lot of the westerns would be filmed in that area. The Sonoran Desert, yeah, or the or the um, Mojave. It can also be in Southern California, it's the Mojave. All right, so climate, climatograms for deserts are tougher to look, are tougher to read, okay? Not so much the precipitation part. The, precip the, the precipitation bars are all low. They all have that in common. But some deserts will have a flatter temperature line. Like this one's temperature line is relatively flat, okay? But some, could still have a bell curve, okay? You could have a higher latitude desert, okay? Like the Gobi Desert, for example, the one behind the Himalayas would have a temperature curve that's more like this, right? Whereas uh, if I was in Egypt, my temperature line would be flat because it's right at the equator, right? But again, they all have in common this pattern down here. Okay, very little rain. There's a whole bunch of months here where there is zero precipitation, right? And then the wettest month, okay, the wettest month is eight millimeters of rain. That's less than a centimeter, okay? There's 10 millimeters in a centimeter. So you're looking at that much rain. That's the wettest month, okay? That's pretty dry. Everybody follow? Okay. So that's the thing you got to look for. To identify a desert, you got to look at the precipitation bars. Tip, when you're looking at the climatograms, make sure you look at the scale, okay? I can make a, I can make a climatogram look really odd if I use the right scale. I can make a desert look really wet 
if I use the right scale. Okay, follow me there. I can make eight millimeters of rain look like those precipitation bars are as tall as the whole climatogram. If I make each line on the graph worth one tenth of a millimeter, I wouldn't do that obviously, but okay, make sure you look at the scale, okay, just so you're sure that you're reading the climatograph correctly. All right, so vegetation, okay, um, what vegetation there is, and there is a fair amount of vegetation in many deserts, okay, it's going to be short. Okay. It's going to be perennial. That means it comes back every year. There's not a lot of annual plants because they tend to need more moisture. Okay. And they're going to be fairly widely spaced. And that's something you can see in all of these pictures. Okay. They're not crowding each other. They can't because then they would have to share resources. And well, the main resource needed here is water. So they can't really share that. So they, they do tend to grow fairly well spaced. There's big patches of nothing between the plants. Right. Most of these plants will have root systems that spread out a really long way, but don't go very deep. Right? It does you no good to have a deep root system if there isn't any moisture deeper down. And the only way to get moisture deeper down is to get moisture on top and have it soak down. Okay? So most desert plants actually have a fibrous root system okay, that goes a long way out and is very shallow so that when it does rain, they can capture every bit of it. Okay. Right? You'll also see large cacti. There's a lot of cacti in the desert, especially in the North American deserts. Okay? You'll see a lot of the saguaro cactus. Okay? Um, if you see a saguaro cactus that's got lots of arms on it, it's very old. Okay? Typically, a saguaro cactus will grow its first arm when it is 80 years old. Okay? That's when it'll grow its first arm. And typically, it grows arms every 20 years after that. Right? So if you see a cactus and it's got lots and lots of arms, it's very, very old. Okay? Those cacti can live to be several hundred years old. Right, John? Okay. Um, all right, that covers all the plant stuff. Okay. Soils. There's virtually no topsoil in the desert because it's too dry. It just blows away. Okay? Without moisture to hold topsoil down, it doesn't stay there. Right? So there's typically no, no topsoil. It's mostly rocky with you know, sand and things like that kind of uh, in there, but there's not a lot of nutrients because there's no water to get them to dissolve. So they kind of form on the surface. If you've ever been to like Utah, you can see like the big salt flats where lakes have dried up. Okay, you see a lot of that in the desert as well. Okay, um, the sea horizon, the, there's not big chunks of rock generally in the sea horizon. It's mostly fairly well weathered. Okay, just kind of crushed gravel and stuff. All right, the animals in the desert have to be well adapted to drought. Camels being the exception, there are not many large mammals in the desert. Okay? Large mammals tend to need too much water. Okay? And without water, okay, you, you just can't get a lot of those. All right, so with the camels, they can tolerate, uh, they can tolerate drought. Okay? Uh, I know everyone thinks, oh, they got all this water stored in their hump. It's such garbage. I don't know who teaches that, but okay, the hump is not like a big cooler of water. Okay, like I, I oftentimes think that people envision like if I was really thirsty, I just go like stab a camel and water would come out. No, okay, they think that way about cacti too. I just stab the cactus and water will come out. No, it doesn't work that way. Okay, um, the hump of a camel is actually more like a big lump of scar tissue. Okay, and it's got tons of blood vessels running through it. So. What it allows the camel to do is to concentrate most of its heat in the hump and keep the places where its organs are cooler. All right, so essentially the hump will run a fever while the rest of the camel remains cooler, even in the hot sun, which allows it to use less moisture to cool itself. You or I go into the desert, we sweat ourselves to death, okay? We just sweat and sweat and sweat until we're dehydrated and we turn into a prune and die, okay? Um, but the camel doesn't have to sweat as much to cool itself because it can let that part of its body raise its temperature, okay? And that'll keep the rest of its body cooler, right? So yes, there's a lot of moisture in that tissue. There has to be because water has a high heat capacity and it can absorb the heat energy and hold it without changing its temperature very much. So yes, there's moisture in there, but it's not a big bottle of water. Okay, that you could just drink from, right? And it's not like the camel's got a straw, you know, and just drinking out of the hump. It doesn't work that way, okay? Um, so most of the mammals tend to be smaller, okay? Rabbits, rodents, okay, things like that. They tend to be smaller, and they tend to be nocturnal, 
Why come out in the day if it's going to be 55 degrees Celsius? Come out at night when it's 20. All right, so a lot of them will tend to be nocturnal. Okay, uh, and they have to have some way to cool themselves that doesn't involve sweating. Sweating in the desert is just a recipe to be dehydrated. So uh, a lot of them will have areas on their body that have lots of capillaries. You can see in the ear of this rabbit here. Okay, you can see the blood vessels in the ear. Um, they can use that to cool themselves. In the same way that when you or I get hot, we get flushed. They do the same thing with their ears, except instead of sweating, they flap the ears. Okay. And when they flap the ears and the blood vessels are full, they can actually cool the blood in the ears and it can act like a, like a cooling apparatus. Okay? That and they tend to stay in the shade and only come out at night. Um, when you have lots of reptiles, reptiles are very tolerant to high body temperatures. They don't regulate their body temperature. So if they start to get hot, they just crawl into a shady spot and sit there. Okay? Um, but they can tolerate dehydration. They don't sweat. They have a scaly covering that doesn't lose a lot of moisture. So they're well suited to the desert. Okay? Uh, and then, of course, lots of bugs. Bugs also are well suited to very dry conditions because they have a thick carapace that goes over top. They don't sweat or things like that. So you're typically going to have those types of organisms surviving in the desert, okay? not things that require a lot of moisture. All right, um, so chemical cycling. If you're going to get things to decompose, water is kind of a key ingredient to that. So chemical cycling in the desert is very, very slow. Right? Um, if something dies in the desert, I mean, it's going to just desiccate as opposed to decompose. That means it'll just shrink as all the water evaporates out of it. Right? And it'll be essentially just a dried husk. Okay. There'll be a few scavengers that'll pick away at it, buzzards or something like that. Okay. But for the most part, it's not going to get a lot of fungus or bacteria growing on it because there's just not enough moisture there. Right. Okay. The grasslands. Okay. So this is the prairie now that we're talking about. This is where we are. Right. Now, if you look at this picture, there's cactus and dead grass and rocks. Does this look like the prairie? Well, it depends. There's different kinds of prairie, okay? And prairie typically borders deserts, okay? There's lots of interaction between the two. This is actually taken just north of Medicine Hat, right? This is in the short grass prairie. So yeah, there's lots of prickly pear cactus, okay? There's lots of really short scrubby grasses because it does get dry there through most of the summer. They don't get a lot of rain through July and August and September, okay? They're going to get most of their rain in May and June. Right. Um, so they're not, it's not going to lead to the development of forests and you know, big tracts of trees or anything like that. Really small, short, kind of burnt up grass is mostly what's going to be there. Okay. But these areas are really important for agriculture, especially if we can irrigate them. Okay. And you see a lot of that down south okay, where farmers have like the big um, irrigation units that can actually water their, their fields and keep them growing. Okay. Uh, these are the very productive areas for that um, just because the soil is good if you can keep it wet. Okay. All right, so grassland climates, okay? This is the climatogram for Calgary, so basically where we are, right? And you can see that there's definite seasonality, right? We've got a bell curve for our temperature. There's definite summer and winter here, okay? So there's distinct seasons. And for the prairie, the rainfall tends to follow the temperature. The wettest month in the prairies is typically June. All right, so right now, this is typically the wettest time of the year. We tend to get the most thunderstorms and hail and all that. Whenever we get those, it's usually July, like early July and most of June when that kind of stuff happens. Okay, so you can see here for Calgary, there's significantly more rainfall in June than any other month, but we get the most rainfall through the kind of spring and summer. Right? Winter is actually one of the driest parts of the year for us. Right? Yeah, we get snow, but for every 10 centimeters of snow, that only adds up to one centimeter of rain. Right? So even if you get lots of snow, it doesn't really add up to a lot of moisture. Okay? So right here, this is taken in the same spot the first picture was. This is near Empress, which is just north of Medicine Hat, okay? and this is in August. Right? So you can see everything is pretty much dormant. There's no trees. Right? There's like sage, every, you know, a little bit of sage every once in a while, but mostly it's just burnt up really short grass. This is the short grass prairie. All right, so side by side, two different kinds of prairie that exist in Alberta, the short grass prairie and mixed grass prairie. All right, this is up by like St. Paul, 
right? So quite a bit further north, right? They get a lot more moisture. It's cooler there, okay? So we get different kinds of grasses. And these are taken less than a week apart, right? So this stuff here, and this was taken after this one, right? So it stays green and moist in this area quite a bit longer. So again, we get different kinds of grasses, okay? In the short grass prairie, right, you're going to get spear grass, grama grass, really drought tolerant things that can grow quickly and then go dormant. Okay? Whereas in the mixed grass prairie, you get crested wheat grass, you get creeping red fescue. You can actually see that growing in the ditch a lot. Okay? Usually by the middle of July, you see this green and then there's kind of a red head on it. Okay? Um, like the seed head is kind of a reddish or rusty color. Okay? That's creeping red fescue. It's a very common grass around here. Okay? Peri oak grass, all of that stuff. Okay? They all tend to be longer and greener well into August because there's more moisture. Okay, soils have thick A horizons for the same reason the, that the savanna had thick A horizons. When grass goes dormant, all the blades and all the organic material it grew don't grow back. They just fall down and they decompose and new grass grows up from underneath. Okay, so there's always this input of nutrients and, and uh, organic material each and every year. And that builds up a very thick topsoil. Okay. All right. Okay, the animals. What do you not see in that picture? Animals. Okay, here's the problem with the prairie. Most of the native animals to the prairie are not there anymore. We've taken care of that. Okay, um, the most common animal that should be on the prairie is bison. Bison used to be in herds of thousands, okay? A herd of 10,000 buffalo would not be uncommon, okay? To go kind of just raging across the prairie, okay? A couple of hundred years ago. And they would be like a big giant lawnmower. They could take the prairie right down so it looked like a, like a golf green, okay? They would just mow it straight down. There'd be this swath of destruction that would follow their herd, okay? They would just take it all right down. Well, obviously you can't have big herds of buffalo going through your crop. Okay, so what do we build? We build fences. Problem is, buffalo don't know what fences are, and they're not very bright. They run into a fence, and they just stop, and they turn around, and they eat all the grass, and then they starve. They're literally that dumb. Okay, that's why you can run them off a cliff. Okay, that's what the natives used to do, right? All the First Nations people would run them off, run them off a cliff. Okay, which is a lot harder than it sounds. Okay, especially if you don't have any horses, because they were doing this before the Europeans brought horses over. Okay, they would just kind of hey and get loud and, and big, and they would you know channel the buffalo towards the cliff. Okay, the reason you can run a buffalo off a cliff is their eyes. Yes, go ahead, uh, Evan. Okay, their eyes are on the side, like most herbivores, so that when they're eating, they can see their predators but it creates a massive blind spot ahead of them, right? So as they're, as you, if you get them running and you get their head down, they don't see what's in front. You just keep them distracted by being to the side of them and you can run them right off a cliff, okay? And that's what they would do, all right? The problem is if any one of them turns, okay? If one of them turns towards you, you're dead, okay? Because the whole herd will turn and follow them and then you best get out the way right? Because they're going to run you down, right? And we're talking about a herd of several thousand of them. That could be pretty dangerous. But they were inconvenient, okay? We didn't keep them around, okay? We kind of got rid of them because, well, they're also kind of angry. And, well, cows are much easier to manage because they're kind of big and dumb and docile, whereas buffalo are big and dumb and angry, okay? Um, so, yeah, you have to, they're, they're not as easy to kind of keep as a domesticated animal, right? So they were selected against, and as soon as horses and rifles came to the prairies, they were easy pickings. And so we hunted them virtually to extinction, right? So they're gone. Uh, other things that are gone, bears, okay? We used to have grizzly and black bear on the prairie, but you don't want those around if you've got, you know, a coop full of chickens or cattle or sheep or whatever, because they kill them, right? So what did we do? Killed them instead. Right? We hunted black bears and grizzly bears virtually to extinction, and they're not found on the prairies anymore. Okay? Same with wolves. There used to be lots of wolves on the prairie. Okay? We killed them off as well because they, they got in the way of farming. All that's really left now, deer, antelope in the southern areas, and coyotes. Right? We mostly left the coyotes alone because coyotes will mostly keep to eating small rodents. 
Okay, they'll eat mice and gophers and things like that. Okay, they're not too often going to be found in your chicken coop or taking down a cow. Right, um, most of the time they stick to smaller stuff, so they didn't get killed off. Um, but yeah, you don't see a lot of the native animals on the prairie, which is why there's just this shot of grass and no animals. Okay, because most of the animals that are on the prairie now are not native. Okay, or if they are, they're just the ones that managed to survive the killing spree that we went on when we first came to the prairies. Okay. All right, um, so questions there on the animals? Okay. okay, chemical cycling on the prairie is not really fast, but it's not brutally slow like the desert either. But again, there's this time of the year called winter where nothing goes on, right? There's no decomposition. So it does take quite a while for things to decompose, excuse me, on the prairie. So any place where you've got seasonality, that's going to be the case. Okay. If there's seasons, especially winter being one of them, everything freezes. That stops fungus from decomposing. It stops bacteria from decomposing things. Insects go dormant and die. Okay. All that kind of stuff that's supposed to get rid of things goes, goes dormant for the winter. So, uh, yes, there's some nutrient cycling, but it takes quite a while. All right. We're combining a couple of biomes into this one. So mostly we're looking at temperate deciduous forest, okay? But we're also looking at broadleaf evergreen and sclerophyllous forests at the same time. They're all generally the same, okay? So deciduous forests, all the trees do what? If it's deciduous, it... Ooh, we gotta know this. Deciduous means to lose lose their leaves. Yeah. Okay. Every year they lose their leaves. All right. Uh, so anything deciduous loses its leaves for the winter. All right. They occupy about 9% of the uh, world's land surface. They're, they're a bit like a tropical rainforest and there can be layers, but not nearly as many. There's like a canopy and an understory and then undergrowth. All right. Um, but again, because they're losing their leaves every year, that builds a lot of, up a lot of organic material on the ground. So you can get pretty good soils here, which is why sometimes we clear these kinds of forests for agriculture, right? There's lots of even predictable rainfall, temperate winters, and nice thick soil. All right, for climate for this area, okay? You'll notice that we still have a bell curve for the temperature, right? This is a place that has definite summer and winter, but it's a bit more temperate than the prairie, okay? If you look at the, uh, the temperatures here, you can see this one doesn't get below freezing almost ever. Okay, maybe just a little bit if you're talking about a Canadian one. Okay, um, but look at the rainfall. Does that look quite a bit different than the prairies? Yeah, not only is it higher than the prairies in general, but it's also a lot more even over the entire year. Okay, whereas in the prairies, there was definite, here's when we get our rain, and then the rest of the year is much drier. Okay, this is much more even keel okay, than, the, than the prairies are, which is why we can get a a thick forest growing in that area. To have thick trees, you've got to have regular rainfall. You can't have a big, long, dry season. All right, so vegetation. Temperate forests are going to typically have oak, beech, hickory, maple, sycamore, okay, things like that. That's what we have in, in central Canada, okay? Lots of maple, obviously. Um, you could also have poplar okay, and things like that. Those are typically temperate types of trees. If we're in a sclerophyllous forest biome, that would be the Mediterranean climate, okay? That's that chaparral we talked about. Um, then you're going to have warmer, warmer type trees like olives, sessile oak, and pine, okay? Those will, those will grow in those kind of areas because they can tolerate the heat better, okay? Uh, and it's also a bit drier. Competition for light's a big deal, so that's why trees tend to get tall and then wide. Okay? They want to capture as much light as possible and shade out their competition. So there's a fair amount of competition for light in the deciduous forest. Okay, Soils, typically a pretty good A horizon, again, because every year a big pile of leaves gets deposited on the ground and decomposes and, and whatever. Okay, B horizons are moderately thick, and then the C horizon down below can either be like Canadian shield, like solid rock, or it can be very fine gravel, but there's almost nothing in between, right? Most of the deciduous forest in, uh, in Canada is on the Canadian shield, right? So that would be just that thick um, section where there was that just big lava field at one point in the very distant past, okay? It's all granite and marble and stuff. Hey, um, animals. Well, 
it's not so wet that you can't have burrowing animals. So there will be some burrowing animals, but there'll also be some arboreal animals. There'll be more bugs, okay? But lots of smaller mammals, rodents and things like that. So that can lead to longer food chains. So you've got, you know, squirrels and mice that can be eaten by foxes and, and weasels and badgers and things like that. And then lynxes that can feed on those, right? So we get larger food chains than you would have in other places, right? Lots of birds, lots of bugs, right? So they can be included in the food chain as well. And then there's going to be your shorter food chains that involve your large animals, right? If you're going to take down a moose, you've got to be a fairly large predator. Okay. You're not going to have a weasel taking down a moose. Right? It has to be something bigger like a wolf, mostly a pack of wolves usually, not a single wolf. Okay. So food chains are a little bit different there. All right, so for the chemical cycling, the chemical cycling is faster than on the prairie because there's more moisture. Right? Also, these tend to be a bit more temperate, so winter is shorter and mild, more mild. Right, so you can typically get your decomposers uh, going for longer periods, plus the cover of the trees keeps the moisture in. It doesn't get exposed to the sun right away, drying it out. So decomposition is going to be more rapid in the deciduous forest than it's going to be on the prairie. Okay. All right, questions on that one? Okay. I'm going to leave it there for today. Okay. So um, things to remember. Climatogram activity coming due very soon. Okay, tomorrow we'll finish up biomes and do our unit exam review. Okay, and I'll put that package, the unit, unit review package, on uh, Google Classroom so you can look at that over the weekend.